Right, so, uh, you know, the topic at hand, cybergogy, it's, uh, I'm obviously no expert on it. He might be, though. And uh, <laughs> the, the thing is that, uh, you know, this term cybergogy is obviously coming to prominence now. Basically, it relates to the study of uh, essentially technically and technically empowered means of uh, pedagogy. That's what it means. At one time, it used to be called uh, techno hutagogy you know, hutagogy is a process where you are, uh, where the sort of learner self-directs to a great degree what he or she or they are going to learn. So, uh, so it's it sort of come out of there and the main, the main outlook of any cybergogical model, given what I've read, is that it needs to be capable, it needs to tick all the critical boxes in the areas of uh, emotive, social, right? And of course, cognitive uh, domains, as far as the learner is concerned. It essentially needs to engage the learner. Any, any successful cybergogical model needs to engage, ensure that the learner is engaged in these three domains. That's what it's come about, uh, come to. So anyway, so let us now proceed further. You have been somebody who's, you know, been a captain of industry. You are somebody who has uh, obviously been a lecturer as well at Stanford and other places. And you also run an institute, a CTL, right, in Pune. So how do you, how do you see things evolving in terms, of this, in, in terms of this particular aspect that, you know, where the learner has a vote, so to speak, that it's not a one-way street? What, what do you say, how do you see that evolving, given all the cyber tools we have at our disposal now? So first of all, it's always wonderful to be at JLF. Uh, you know, so uh, great, great to be here and great to be back uh, again in physical form. Uh, where I think actually that students always have had a vote. You know, if you go back um, to when, well, when I when I graduated uh, in uh, many many years ago, uh, you wear a graduation gown, and especially when you get a master's, you wear a hood. The hood that you get um, has a pocket in it. What people usually neglect is that that pocket in the hood was, it, the hood qualified you to go around and give public lectures uh, in various towns and villages in medieval Europe. And the reason your hood had this pocket was that people could put money in it if they thought what you say was saying made sense. So there was a very direct connection between uh, uh, audience and, uh, uh, and teacher. Uh, and if you said things that people liked, then you got paid more. So there was actually uh, a great deal of agency for students going back 500 and 800 years. So I don't think it's a reflection only of technology and the role that technology has played to give, give individuals agency. Somewhere along the way, institutions, as institutions became stronger, higher education institutions became stronger, they became somewhat more prescriptive in terms of people saying, a group of people saying that this is what we should actually teach students. And then you had the, the, the development of sort of lectures, of textbooks, uh, with a certain discipline that needed to be provided by way of knowledge. But the best institutes, without question, always have great space for discussion and they give students choice. Uh, one of the elements that I think we miss in our country is the flexibility that students have to decide which courses to take. Uh, we tend to be too prescriptive in our, even our better higher education institutions. And I think the better higher education uh, institutions worldwide give students almost complete choice over what courses to take, even if they have to follow some framework uh, they have a choice. And that choice is an essential element of high quality higher education. This is even before you get to technology. Now, I think the, the bit that I worry about, and you know, one of the, one of the things that I'm involved with at present with a group of uh, we're, we're the 13 of us who are involved in trying to set up a, a, a new university uh, that we hope will be a full service university covering all fields. Uh, that we hope to start at the end of this year and will grow hopefully going forward. And as we worry about how to conceptualize education, we're very clear that 
technology has to play a very big role. And technology should play two roles. One, it should play a key role in giving one access to the best teachers worldwide for larger classes and for lectures. Uh, so you combine large lecture experiences that are all online, um, so you can then get the best in the world in that particular subject, with small intensive classes uh, in person. But I, I would be very worried about a totally 100% online student experience. I'm not sure it would be a high quality experience. I mean, you know, look at this. I yeah. mean, you know, it's much warmer than uh, doing it all online. So, yeah, and the other thing is, of course, but uh, Cybergogy does score in one respect. The sort of the um, mendicant slash uh, itinerant teachers of medieval Europe, they could also be paid in pain if the, could, <laughs> if the audience did not you, like what you could, they you taught. Could, you, could part of the, you could put other than money in, yeah. that, in that pocket. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, but uh, when, when you have this sort of distance learning, this modern day distance learning, see after all we are talking about distance learning that has now got greatly enhanced with the use of technological apparatus. So uh, that sort of also creates that distance, you know, between the, the, what you were talking about. Even, even given the traditions of our country, if you look at the Guru Shishya tradition, yeah. right, the, no blind obedience is called for that the, the student is supposed to examine the teacher thoroughly before he submits. It's not, you know, it's not as if, you know, that uh, this is a guru and uh, the guru is going to say whatever and the student is going to accept. There's a whole sort of preamble before the student submits to the teacher. So anyway, having said that, but see, but that is the whole point that, you know, with the advent of MOOCs and stuff like that and open courseware, MIT being a pioneer in that uh, area, the whole matter became that the content and the pace could be set by the learner. Student. That it's a matter of negotiation. But that is never the case in a semester-based system in a classroom. The content and the pace is definitely not dictated by the, you know, by the learner. Where, so how do you see that? How do you, how do you see that changing? Do you, do you see the kind of MOOC kind of environment, the Udemy, MOOC, you know, Udemy and other platforms, that kind, of, that kind of ethos going, uh, sort of also infecting the old style classroom. Do you see that happening? I, I do. I think, I think classes increasingly are going, to, are going to take, I think we're go increasingly going to have blended learning. Uh, we're going to have learning where some learning happens as a result of student choice, um, where the student decides which lecture to listen to, which subject, and perhaps even which teacher for that subject, uh, which, and I think the moment you break that barrier between, and you give the student the choice to decide that, okay, if they, if for example, they're taking a course in, oh, I don't know, um, in political theory, right? We were just in a really interesting session on democracy. If you're taking a course in political theory, uh, you can take that course in political theory from the very best teacher worldwide. Now the question will be, does that then lead to a requirement to have standardized testing, or can you have testing that reflects that particular content that's being taught? I think we can get over that probably through some kind of modular arrangement where the testing can also be online, um, and one can then get a great deal of access to the best knowledge worldwide when it's provided in these larger environments. But I still think you need to supplement it with um, more intense, one-on-one -on -one, um, personal interaction um, between fa faculty and student, but also between students themselves. Because as we, as we know, you know, half the learning in college happens student to student, not faculty to student, not textbook to student, but student to student. And I'm not that clear that online, only online, um, only virtual, uh, enables that very intense student-to-student -student interaction. Maybe, maybe some better platforms as they come along will start to address that in an effective way, but I think we've still got lots of, lots of progress to make there. See, for the sake of argument, we could say that, you know, in the future, immersion using virtual reality could enable a 
peer-to-peer -peer environment on the, in, a, in, a, in the course of a sort of, uh, you know, cybergogic you know, course. But, what, what I'm, what, but the point that you raised is very important. It's also about evaluation. It's both about participation and evaluation. Yeah. And evaluation over the, while participation itself is fraught, when you are purely on a sort of, uh, you know, technologically enabled uh, teaching platform, the, the only thing that goes in favor of that is that, that there's, a, there's that self-selection element. It is because you want to learn something that you've taken this MOOC in the first place. So that sort of deals with the learner's commitment part. But the evaluation uh, issue remains, and that I think is a gray area. It is, it is a gray area. You know, it, it may be it may be significant progress. You know, when I used to when I used to teach my course, students used to love my course, but they hated my quizzes. Um, and uh, and and probably if I actually came up with you know a more standardized form of testing, would probably have been an advance for my course. <laughs> so so I would be all in favor of uh, uh, if we can figure out. Um, a more standardized way of actually assessing learning. Um, and you supplement that with, uh, with multiple inputs. Uh, that might be a very productive way of doing it. You know, one of the, one of the things that, uh, one of the people in our, in our group that's involved in this university project is one of the founders of Infosys, um, and uh, Chris Kopal Krishnan. And he's been talking a lot in our discussions about the need to use technology to individualize the student experience. Now, individualized experience is something that institutions find very, very difficult to do. Because if you have 5,000 students, how do you individualize a student experience? It's very difficult. That's why you have majors, you, have, you try to be prescriptive, you group students according to their own choices and interests. Um, but you group them because it's much easier to deal with a group than to deal with each individual 5,000 people. But for technology, problem goes away. So if you can actually build that good platform, and that's one of the goals that we have, to try to build that platform such that the student experience is individualized, but the quality of the education that the student gets at the end of the day is somehow standardized. Um, I don't know if we'll succeed, but it's, uh, it's, it's what we're trying to do. Yeah? Well, yes. Uh, yeah? it, has an, it is an endeavor in progress, I guess, yeah. because standardized yeah. testing has, I don't think, been achieved really beyond, you know. Be be beyond, beyond uh, uh, well, I mean, there's... Not know, for any uh, complex subject, really. Well, you know, if you... Okay. So, take the IAS exam. Right now, the IAS exam, exactly. the IAS exam is a standardized test, right, covering a very wide range of highly complex issues, right? Um, well, and could be held up as an example for either argument. Yeah, uh, I mean, but I think it, it certainly it certainly measures it certainly plays a role of of measuring ability to grasp a fairly wide range of complex issues. Um, it, probably, it, it probably leaves out, it le probably leaves out people who would be pretty good administrators as well. So it probably plays some role in screening and selection. Um, does it really work in terms of attracting a diverse input? Probably not. They don't really want diversity in the bureaucracy. Not, I mean, in the sense that, yeah, they want, they want diverse, they want a diverse set of people as far as their names and appearances are concerned, naturally. But they don't really want diversity of, you know, most, most, in, of most, ethos. most institutions, most institutions, you know, recruit people like us, right? I mean, the, the, the famous phrase, because you, 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 you like to deal with people who you are familiar with, and then you actually, that ends up killing diversity. So it's something to consciously be mindful of and work against. Yeah. In fact, I would say that that is more of a negative kind of selection process, that entire UPSC machinery with its 36 different services, etc., etc. Yeah. That's more designed to keep out people that you don't want inside the corridors of government, rather than bring in, you know, the sort of talent so, that uh, the country might so, need. So maybe, maybe, yeah. a good, maybe a good project is to devise a good 
virtual exam for the civil service. Perhaps, perhaps. We should, you, you're we should, the, you're we should, the. We should, we should work on it. I think it'll be hugely unpopular. <laughs> Very effective. Yeah. It might, yeah. it might, it might lead to the detention center also. <laughs> At some awesome. point. <laughs> yeah. Those are, those are the places I don't want to touch. Yeah. You can touch anything. Just don't put, in fact, I've already overstepped perhaps a little bit. Anyway, if anybody is listening, please don't disregard. No, 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 no. We, we're going to go, we're going to go away from here and set up this project. So, yeah. Yeah. so coming back to the topic, so uh, the the issue remains the same, though. How committed is the learner, and how committed is the teacher? So, right. That that is never going to go away, with so, respect to what we do. So you know, I think we have to. You also have to decide w which student are you designing the education system for. You've got some students who are really, you know, they're, they're wonderful students. They're, uh, they, 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 they're going to learn in any environment. You know, regardless of how, how, how badly a teacher teaches, how, uh, how much one tries through rote learning to stamp out every bit of creativity and independent thought in the student, the student will thrive in spite of that, in that environment. Because some students are simply great students. You have to design an education system that works for the median student, right? And works for a much wider set of students. And I, let, me, let me give you an example. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was in college, uh, there was a requirement to take a course, they were, uh, to take courses in what was called breadth, right? So you had to take courses across the university in various dif different departments, completely different to your own. I, mean, I was an engineering undergraduate. Um, I needed to take courses in the humanities and social sciences. As I was a very confused student and didn't know what I was really interested in, this was wonderful for me because I was able to wander around the university taking things in everything that I was sort of interested in that time. But I had many friends in the engineering department who saw those that requirement to take these courses in history and literature and so on as being terribly onerous that kept them f away from real learning that mattered to them, right? Now, if you give students that choice, um, they would have opted uh, to not take any of those breadth courses. When I've run into those students, you know, much, much later, 10 years out, 20 years out, the one thing they definitely say is they, they did not think they should have taken more engineering courses when they were in college. They wish they'd taken many more courses in music and various other things that have really enriched their lives subsequently. So maybe as a student, right, you need to get the balance right between the student having agency and choice and there being, there being this framework of institutional understanding that says education, really fine education, is more than just giving students agency. It has to be about learning from what good education is all about. And then you give a combination of some choice with a certain framework that leads to high quality. Of course, in our country, when, the moment you talk about engineering, it's all about employability or the lack thereof, you know. So, so, that's so. A, that, that can be achieved through the qualification. You know, so you, you walk out with your degree in engineering and um, you, have, uh, you have that employment opportunity. But if in the course of getting that degree in engineering you also learn something about history and music and art and literature and the kinds of topics that get debated at GLF, I think that's so much richer for every student coming out of the system. Okay, we need your closing remarks now because we are almost out of time. And uh, just, so it would be fair to assume that you are a votary of the hybrid model, right? I'm, I'm a complete votary of the hybrid model. I, I think actually that technology is beginning to provide some of that agency. It's bringing, beginning to provide some of that individual choice blended with a framework that could be technically put in. But it will need this constant search for balance between um, an understanding of what a really good education involves and the individual choices that the student makes to, to make the experience a truly enriching experience. 
I mean, at the end of the day, you know, uh, one of the people in our group is Pankaj Chandra, who is the Vice Chancellor of Ahmedabad University. And he has this wonderful description of what the purpose of higher education is. And he says the purpose of education is, well, to create some employment opportunities. That's one part, right? Um, it's also to create, to, to make bet people better citizens, right? And it's also to make, give people a sense of what they really are after in life and to enrich one's own life with meaning. So that's what I, higher education actually has to chase. It has to chase all those three objectives and you need to get that right, that balance right between agency for student and choice and the, uh, and the framework of what actually gives you that better quality experience. Right, I think we are fresh out of time. We have five minutes, so should we just do a quick Q&A? Yeah, we should. Let's, so, a couple yeah. of questions only, please. Maybe we, maybe we collect the three, yeah, okay. collect the questions yeah, and then... Uh, let's answer. collect the questions and then a comprehensive yeah. answer will yeah. be delivered. Right, please. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, something, something that teachers always do is that you go to the first row first. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just questions, yeah. please. No comments, yeah. apparently. Okay, so uh, I'm in 11th grade and I'm like still in school. So uh, it's, it was very interactive to learn about this. And then uh, I had this idea in my mind that uh, through, through supplementing the, uh, the cybergogy along with the, the conventional way, like I think uh, making it uh, more theoretical in, uh, in the conventional way actually limits the, uh, limits the child as well. Like, like uh, I know people from, uh, from my school who are in, uh, in CBSE and then they have very limited courses. Like they want to learn a lot, but then they are very limited to uh, uh, certain courses. But like we are in, uh, we are in different boards. So we, we get a chance to learn all of that. Uh, the different things, the different courses and participate in all the other things. So uh, through, through uh, Cybercology, I think uh, there is an opportunity to learn uh, a lot more than the, just the conventional road learning methods. And I think you'll have to move on to your question now. That's one of my questions. That, like, uh, much greater, much greater opportunities. Yeah, like supplementing actually limits. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Please, uh, over there, the gentleman there on the fourth row. Yeah, on the left. On my left. Yes. Yeah. 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 It was very well said, and uh, it was very presumptuous uh, to put coins in coat pocket of Roshad Forbes after the session. <laughs> I wanted to say that, but I have to ask a question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a medieval, medieval custom. Some, some medieval customs are best. I'm from Europe, nothing to do with the subcontinent. Uh, in, in terms of evaluation, now chat GPT is there. So AI, AI will definitely change everything in the sense that even plagiarism will be very difficult to catch. You know, chat GPT can give you different, different answers. So, so you'll have to move on to your question. The question is this, what will be the impact of AI on education? And particularly in terms of evaluating uh, the students. Right. I think, yeah, please, the lady in the third row. On, yes. Um, now, Shah, as someone who's spent your life between industry and education, um, how do you think we can encourage more Indian industry to be broader on the employability side of things? So, how do we get more Indian engineering companies, for example? to believe that there's value in them hiring historians, literature majors, sociologists. Yeah. Oh, we have a lot of questions. OK, quickly over there. I like you already, but. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, should we? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to wrap it up now. Okay. What's your question? The question is, uh, why don't the higher uh, education institutions don't take charge of the, the life learning rather than the courses? Okay, so, 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 so let's, let's take those four questions. Uh, maybe I'll take them in reverse, yeah. in reverse, reverse order. Yeah, okay. So, so let me start with the life learning question. 
you're absolutely right. That's what students, that's, students learn in a whole variety of ways and experiences. It's one of the reasons why on-campus education is so powerful, because you have many more such opportunities. And I think for institutions, institutions should start thinking about themselves as having access to students 24 by 7. Now, if they have access to students, that doesn't mean that they have to provide instruction 24 by 7 or to be prescriptive about what students learn 24 by 7 but they can certainly provide opportunities for student learning 24 by 7. So how do you bring in that combination of coursework, access to various other classes, and I'll take the first question at the same time, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. So that, that you know, that what, are the, what the great thing that technology does is it provides access, access everywhere, right? And so you can be sitting in Jaipur and have access to the best teacher speaking about a very obscure subject halfway around the world. That's the wonderful power of technology. And the more we can open that up for students everywhere and build that in institutionally, what institutions are not doing well enough is to use what other institutions do and build their own coursework and their quality of experience into, uh, into something that accesses this learning everywhere. To take the point on what can Indian companies do, I wish, I think we have to make the case. But I think the case will be made uh, on the basis of competitiveness. I think companies will still simply, the better companies will simply start recruiting the best students, regardless of field and discipline. For too long in India, I think we've had this sort of streaming mechanism, you know, that uh, kids, when they grow up, their parents, if they're a bright child, um, their parents look at them strangely if they do not want to go and study engineering or medicine. Uh, and I, think, uh, I think we have to move away from that and, uh, and place an equal value on every subject. It'll take a while for that to happen, but as that, as that starts balancing out, I think we'll end up with better companies and a better society. Um, the last point, any, any uh, yeah, on, on, I, will, I will take the AI question outside. <laughs> okay, but thank you. <laughs>